have you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you for Appreciate having me. My pleasure. Um, so we said there in the intro that the mobile gaming market has eclipsed the console market, and you were saying just beforehand that it's you know it's even eclipsed the major studios and stuff. That's right. The gaming market. So mobile gaming is one segment of the gaming market, but we really think about our industry as the entire entertainment industry. At the end of the day, we're competing with uh, you know movies and music and television shows for at the end of the day attention, right? And we're all in the inter entertainment business, so we think a lot about the whole industry, uh, the whole entertainment business. And so the the gaming business is now 115 billion dollars worldwide. Wow. That's including console, it's including mobile, it's including PC. Whereas the box office has obviously, for movies, has grown much slower. So now the box office industry worldwide is about $35 billion. So gaming is about three times that. Now obviously the movie industry includes DVDs and streaming and a few other things, but you know, the, the gaming industry is now probably the largest you know, tied with television uh, in terms of total revenues on a worldwide basis. And traditionally, I mean, console games have been huge budget games, things like Grand Theft Auto, like absolutely massive. And then, you know, freemium games have been traditionally much more low budget, and the idea is let's throw out as many games as possible and see what sticks. So what has that meant, that kind of shift? What has that meant for the budgets of, of, of freemium games? This is one of the, the most rapidly changing parts of the mobile industry. We're just really free to play gaming in general. So budgets are definitely moving up. So people are really expecting higher quality these days. Um, there's roughly 500 games submitted to the Apple App Store every day. Wow. 500. So to really, you're, you're not, it, when, app, when the iPhone first came out, you know, there was a dearth of content, right? So the strategy back then, about six years ago, was to put out you know, relatively low budget games, and then you know, you'd be one of you know, a few hundred games in the App Store. And you could really you know, break through and, and get a pretty big audience and build a meaningful business. Today, if you're trying to compete against 500 you know, games that are being launched every single day, plus what's happening is that you see Clash of Clans and Candy Crush have multi-year runs, you really have to put out an incredibly high quality product from the get-go. And so these days, mobile budgets are ranging from, you know, from the top gaming companies in the world, you're generally pushing five to $10 million you know, for getting a, a mobile game into the marketplace today. And um, I, I personally, we at Kabam love that because we want to be able to put you know, incredible talent and make a game that can truly compete with the games that we grew up playing as, as little kids, right? We want to create that quality of game. And so at Kabam, we've, we've been focused on what we call AAA console quality games for mobile devices, which means that on you know, an iPad, an iPhone 6, you know, Samsung Galaxy 6 at this point, you know, you can really create an experience that would have played on an Xbox, you know, two years ago. You can create that experience and it'll run on the hardware that's in hundreds of millions of people's pockets on a daily basis. And, and so we're if, oh, Your oh. mic is set. Sorry about that. So we're able to compete, we want to compete with that in terms of quality. And I think you're going to see uh, 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 you know, companies like Kabam really push the quality bar and really start to rival what's on consoles or PC games. And we're very excited about that. And what does it mean for your development process? You know, Kabam as a company, I mean, how does a game get from, from idea to, to actually being on the App Store in terms of somebody in your office coming up with an idea? Yeah. So these days, it's, it's very sophisticated. If you're going to put something into the market that you're going to invest $10 million behind, uh, there's a lot of work that goes behind that. So there's a, a, a good, we have a, what we call a consumer insights team uh, at Kabam. So we're constantly testing out ideas um, with the market. So we're, we, we, have a, a lar you know, we, we have about 200 million people who've downloaded Kabam games. And so wow. we, we've got a very large audience, and we're able to test a lot of different types of ideas. And we'll start with, OK, we, we have, it, it starts with our own creativity. So we'll have a bunch of different ideas that we think about. We'll have hundreds of them. And then we'll test you know, a, a bunch of different concepts that cost us ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to test. Um, and then we'll narrow that down to a set that we then create a demo for. And then that demo gets viewed by internal, you know, uh, what we call a brain trust. Uh, as well as, again, of course, going to the consumers. 
And then from that, we went down even further to really just a very small handful. Uh, these days, about three to four game projects a year is kind of what we're, we're talking about these days. And, and those will get the full sort of budget and the full resources to go through a, uh, you know, the green light and, and come to market. And then when the game does come to market, how do you, you know, how do you make it a hit? I mean, you know, what kind of machine is behind that? And how, how have you guys been so successful? It, these days, it really is a machine. So the, the interesting thing about mobile gaming these days is that, um, you know, for the, to give you guys a stat, in the Super Bowl uh, this year, there was zero console gaming ads. Zero from the EAs and Activision, yeah. zero from Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo. But there were three mobile gaming companies that ran Super Bowl ads. So I think a lot of people are pretty familiar with the Liam Neeson ad uh, yeah, that yeah. Supercell run. Uh, people are also pretty familiar with the Kate Upton ads that Game of War ran. There's a small company called Ucool uh, that launched a new game you know, in the Super Bowl as well. So did you guys these, run an ad? We did not run a Super Bowl ad, but I think uh, do you, you think that kind of, see one you think that kind of traditional, um, you know, offline advertising is effective in this market? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We, you know, the gaming industry is probably, you know, the gaming industry is is probably at the forefront of a number of different technologies, big data, cloud infrastructure. These were things that uh, you know, the gaming industry was wrestling with and really pushing the boundaries on five to six years ago before it kind of became mainstream in the overall technology market, and so we store. You know, we're, we're able to track every single ad impression out there, whether it be a digital ad, whether it be a television uh, ad, and then we look at you know, a number of different metrics, starting with downloads, of course, but we can look at your know, tutorial completion, we can look at how many people stopped playing our games and started coming back and play the game again after they see an ad. We can understand all sorts of things in terms of how players are reacting, and we test hundreds and hundreds of different types of campaigns all the time. And so you'll see, I think, the gaming industry from a consumer internet experience, you're going to see pushing, of, of course, television. You'll see a number of different outdoor ad campaigns uh, in major metro areas. So you'll probably start seeing things like you know, bus wrapping, subway takeovers, anywhere where there's a high uh, your urban density with you know, pretty high uh, per capita income, you're probably going to see some really interesting integrated marketing experiences from gaming companies. It's interesting you say high per capita income. So those are the kind of people who are playing uh, freemium games. They're the people that you're targeting. Absolutely. So you know, in our industry, we think about our industry very much like the sports industry. So yeah. you have, you know, for our games, you can download them, you can play them for free. And that's, that's similar to the, very, the super casual sports fan watching, you know, turning on the TV and, and watching uh, you know, football or basketball or anything else for free. And then you've got the people who are you know, willing to pay $30, $40, $50 $50 to go attend a game. We've got a bunch of players like that that you pay that type of uh, you know, money for a game. And then you have the guys or girls that are in the luxury boxes or sitting at the 50-yard line on you know, court side uh, you know, who are paying thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a year for those experiences. And the mobile gaming industry is very similar. And we have uh, a, a relatively small number of people who are willing to pay tens and even hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for wow. a gaming experience. And for those fans and for those customers, we really try to create an ultra premium white glove experience, much like you would experience if you were to walk into the Wynn Casino, um, you know, with, you know, it'd be, be known as a I mean, what one. does that mean? I mean, do you personally go to these people's houses and thank them? Thank you so much for spending a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars with the Kabam? <laughs> you know, we, we're trying to do more and more interesting things. So for example, with our latest hit game, uh, Marvel Contest of Champions. You know, we're working on really interesting stuff with Marvel and with Disney in terms of creating fan experiences that cross different mediums. Right? And, and Disney's the perfect partner to do this with in terms of you know, being you know, an extra on the next you yeah, know, wow. Marvel movie, right? In terms of you know, being at Comic-Con and meeting some of the writers, you know, being at, um, you know, being at uh, a, a number of interesting things where you're getting the first you know, view of a new comic book that's coming out. You're getting just incredible, interesting experiences that we could deliver to people, not just in the game, but around an entire experience of being a Marvel fan. So one of the unique things about Kabam is that we've had great relationships with, uh, obviously, <laughs> Disney, Marvel. We did uh, Fast and Furious 7, uh, as well as Fast and Furious 6 with Universal. 
We've worked with uh, Paramount on Godfather. Uh, we've worked with Time Warner as well as MGM on Lord of the Rings. So we, we think about creating uh, kind of transmedia experiences that crosses mobile as well as television as well as movies. And, that's, uh, and then you can create really interesting fan experiences that you can sort of imagine somebody being willing to pay tens of thousands of dollars for. So they're all licensing agreements with, with, with um, Marvel and with... So those are the easier ones yeah. to do. The ones where we have our internal IP, like Kingdoms of Camelot, yeah. where our top players you know, well into the hundreds of thousands as well, you know, we'll create experiences where they're able to meet with the production uh, you know, team that's designing the next major feature. We want to give people a kind of an inside scoop into what's happening, um, get their feedback on new features and systems that we're designing for the game. So it's all about making somebody feel incredibly special you know, for being and a loyal does, customer. What does a hit game look like for you guys? I mean, how do you define that internally? And how many, how many hits do you have? Because I guess we look at some companies, you look at things like Angry Birds, obviously that game got out there and there were hundreds of millions of, of users and they spun out a whole company uh, with a billion yeah. dollar valuation based on you know, one, one game. Um, and now, you know, there are concerns that they, they've fallen away. They're not able to, to replicate that. How yeah. many hits do you guys have? And how do you ensure you don't fall into that trap? Sure. So, so Rovio is an interesting um, example. While they are mobile gaming, they started their company at a time where <clears throat> they created games that were called premium price games, which means you download Angry Birds for 99 cents and then you play it, right? And so it, it's similar to the console or PC game industry where you pay you know, something up front, and then you, you buy the game and you own it, and you can play it as many times as you want. So <clears throat> that has rapid, in the mobile gaming industry, rapidly transitioned from the Angry Birds and some of the other games that are, so, that are similar, that were premium download games, to a free-to-play model, right? And so I, I think you see kind of some of the earlier generation really falter when there was a business model change in the industry. And similarly, our industry has gone through platform changes as well. So a lot of gaming companies got started on Facebook, didn't quite make the transition to mobile, and have not you know, done as well because of missing that, that type of a transition. And those transitions will absolutely kill you as a company, you know, whether you're in, a, in the gaming or entertainment industry or you're in a B2B business or whatever it is, if you're missing a major platform transition, your business is probably not gonna survive you know, that, that type of a miss. So it's really important to kind of think far, farther ahead. In, in terms of Kabam, we've been very lucky that we've had four you know, major hits. So we started with Kingdoms of Camelot as being our first $100 million franchise. So wow. we, we think about $100 million as kind of the, the, the hit size. Sounds reasonable, yeah. So we've had Kingdoms of Camelot, uh, Dragons of Atlantis, and then The Hobbit, uh, which is getting closer to $200 million. So and The then, Hobbit is like it's a, it's a license and the other are two internal? That's right. Okay. And then Marvel is our latest one where uh, you know, if you read some of the news out there, we're, you know, we haven't disclosed anything publicly, but the, the rumor and speculation is that we're doing a couple hundred million dollars just this year for that game. Wow, wow. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty impressive, and it's uh, pretty awesome that you guys managed to avoid that trap. But, you know, recently you, you raised quite a, a large round. So, what, 150 million was it? 120 million. 120 million, and total so far? Uh, total, we've raised about two, a little bit over 200. You know, it's interesting if you think of the timing. It was a couple of months back when you were raising that round, and I guess in terms of the wider gaming industry, you had PopCap games that had been sold to, to EA, I think, two years previously, and they were, you know, essentially, uh, you know, they're closing a lot of that down. And then Zynga, of course, you know, which was the, you know, the, the, the real kind of golden boy of the gaming industry for quite some time had IPO'd, and its stock was, was falling quite considerably. Um, you know. I, given the way the market was, it must have been quite difficult. And how did you guys succeed in, in raising such an enormous amount of money? I mean, what kind of roadmap do you have for the future <laughs> um, that keeps investors you know, so happy? Well, I, I think you touched on a couple of the key facts already. So one is that we've had, you know, we're not a one-hit wonder. We've been able to demonstrate you know, multiple games that have hit franchise level sort of um, you know, numbers. So that, that's kind of one, is that we're one of the very, very few gaming companies out there that have consistently you know, produced, you know, we have a methodology, we have incredible leadership and very talented studios all over the world that have shown an ability to make you know, repeat products successful. And, um, and, and so that's incredibly important. 
The second is that we've had um, uh, just a unique experience of working together with your major Hollywood partners to create these, these products. And it's not just a license, li licensor, licensee relationship, it's really a, a partnership in terms of combining how we create interactive experiences across different media. And we've developed an interesting playbook for how we do that, and that's been incredibly unique uh, for the market. And then the third is that, you know, of course, we just had incredible revenue growth, incredible profitability since 2012. And so we've, we've been able to have a sustained business for a, a significant amount of time. And I think all of those things get put together and in spite of some of the challenges that you see from some of the other companies in the space. How old is Kebab successful. now? It's not, I mean, it's not a, 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 you know, it's not two years old or anything like right. that. You have a proven track record. Right. How, how old are you guys now? It's about, uh, we're about five years old as a gaming company. Pretty, pretty, pretty good record, pretty good growth. And that, that 120 million, a, a huge chunk of that came from Alibaba, of course. That's right. You know, the, the Chinese e-commerce site that's yeah. hugely successful, the most successful IPO of the last 12 months. Um, obviously, you took that money from Alibaba for a reason. So what are the plans for growth? So if you look at Kabam's revenue, uh, we did $400 million last year. Uh, about 60% of that is from North America. And the remainder, about 35% is from Europe and 5% sort of South America, Middle East, and a few other you know, areas. Uh, and almost zero from Asia. So we're talking about zero in China, zero in Japan, zero in Korea, zero in the Philippines and Malaysia and Indonesia. Some really interesting I mean, if I markets. was Alibaba, I'd be kind of nervous giving you 120 million with that. But obviously, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, you convinced them otherwise. You see this as well, a huge really potential rather than yeah, so, yeah, absolutely, right? And that, that's absolutely the case is that we're not, we're a company that's very deliberate about what we do. So we've been operating in China for four years. We've had a studio there making games for the Western market in China for four years. We've built a great reputation in China as being an incredibly talented you know, studio out there. Uh, and, and so when Alibaba looked at the investment, they, they were able to reference a lot of these things that make Kabam pretty unique in terms of multiple hits, relationships with Hollywood, a unique founding team that's Chinese American, uh, and operations in China. And so when we say we were going to, you know, the reason why we uh, wanted a Chinese strategic investor is because we wanted to take our games to China as well as the rest of Asia. And when uh, you know, of course, we had lots of questions about, well, how are you going to do that? You know, what's, what's your understanding of the marketplace? And we can enumerate all of the challenges as well as opportunities in Asia. And you know, we had studied it for a long time. So I think when you put that together with a partner like Alibaba, who's just an absolute giant in their own market, and you sort of look at that and you say, wow, magical things can happen if you put these two companies together. And so that, that really was, you know, for Jack Ma and a few others on the, the investment committee, that was really the, the thinking behind why this partnership made a lot of sense. So when are we going to see your first, the first Kabam titles in, in China and, and made for the Chinese market? So our, our first game that we're taking over there is Marvel Contest of Champions. It's a unique fighting game. When we talk about AAA quality, you know, Marvel is absolutely that. It's made by a, a team of uh, about 50 people that have combined about 900, um, not, uh, 900, hour, 900 years of experience, sorry, it's yeah. 50 people plus the broader studio, about yeah. 900 years of making console games uh, in terms of experience. So it's truly a world-class team that has put that project together. It's a uh, top 10 game in, uh, globally already without being in Asia. And you'll see us as we uh, put, we've built out a special team in Beijing. We've uh, partnered with a leading game company in China called Longtu uh, to bring that game to China. So you're going to see us launch that game in the fall of this year, and I'm incredibly excited about what that game could do in China. Awesome. And what are the, what are the key differentiators um, you know, of, of Kabam going into China versus you know, the, the current market? I mean, how, how different are you guys? How so are you going to lead? China is a really tough market. There's the great firewall in China. You've got government regulations that prevent you from going there. Um, so we've been uh, carefully studying all that. We've, we, probably the most unique thing about Kabam is that we've been operating in China for four years. Right? We have 250 people in our Beijing wow. office, and uh, it's led by one of my co-founders. And so we have a deep commitment to that market and a deep understanding of that market given how long we've been operating there. The second is that we've put together a world-class partnership with Alibaba, certainly unique in terms of the access and the ability to 
uh, you know, make a game successful through marketing and a number of other initiatives in China. And the third is that you know, we're, we're pro we are the only Western gaming company that's led by Chinese Americans. So we've had, you know, I speak you know, Chinese, my co-founders all speak Chinese. Uh, so we've been um, you know, looking at the China market, thinking about it for a long time, and the China market just surpassed the US market in terms of how, how big the mobile gaming market is. So it's a big opportunity. Awesome. Well, exciting times ahead, Kevin. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.